Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for um, this Victorian Building Authority's Practitioner Education Series webinar on research insights for water damage and the risk of mould in buildings. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to our elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples attending the session today. As Victoria's building and plumbing regulator, the BBA is committed to ensuring a confident and thriving industry and continues uh, to collaborate with stakeholders to enhance practitioner competencies and deliver improved outcomes for the community. The BBA also has a statutory function to conduct, conduct or promote research relevant to the regulation of uh, the building and plumbing industries. Uh, our research program gives us the evidence to inform our regulatory decision and influence improvements to the uh, building regulatory system. Today's webinar is about insights from research the BBA conducted in partnership with the Victorian Managed Insurance Authority and Victorian Uni University on indoor mould and moisture damage in Victorian residential buildings. Water damage routinely tops the list of defects encountered in buildings, and this is represented in complaints to the VBA and claims to VMIA. Our pit areas and waterproofing and drainage issues are commonly occurring areas of compliance risk we identify through the VBA's proactive inspections program. Uh, the insights gained from uh, this research identifies the improvement opportunities for building design, construction, certification, regulation, and regulatory oversight, some of which uh, today's presenter, Dr. Tim Law, will discuss. Uh, we are sharing these insights with you in this webinar to inform you how to improve the quality of your building and plumbing work in high-risk areas and to reduce the risk of water ingress and indoor mould in Victorian buildings. The VBA is also using these insights to inform our proactive inspections program and its continuing focus on areas of compliance risk that could cause water ingress and moisture damage. And we will continue to work with you and uh, our stakeholders to build the uh, body of knowledge, raise awareness of the risks of water ingress and moisture damage in buildings uh, and measures that uh, should be taken to improve occupants' health and safety. To begin today's sessions, architectural scientist and lead researcher, Dr. Tim Law will present the research findings, as well as some opportunities for improvement for building designers, building surveyors and inspectors um, in the building and plumbing field. Uh, following this, VPA principal plumbing specialist, Anwar uh, Gayet will present a recent case study relating to water ingress and moisture damage that show an example of what our inspection services team members are seeing on site during proactive inspections. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that this session is being recorded and uh, a link to this presentation will be made available on our website along with uh, previous webinars. We have set time aside at the end of this presentation for questions and I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and encourage you to type your questions there throughout the presentation. And we'll attempt to address as many of your questions in the time available. Uh, you can also vote and comment on the questions that you're most interested in. Before I welcome and hand over to Dr. Tim Moore, I'd like to thank him and his research team at Victoria University for the valuable work that they have undertaken to produce the research report and today's presentation. Dr. Law is an architectural scientist specialising in indoor mould in Australian buildings. Uh, he co-authored a scoping study of condensation in residential buildings in 2016 with the Australian Building Codes Board, which became the basis for the condensation provisions in the National Construction Code. Uh, and he's a well-respected uh, researcher, lecturer and expert in his field. Welcome and uh, over to you, Dr. Law. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you for the VB for organizing this session. Thank you all for turning up for today's session. I, um, let me just make sure that I've got everything going. Yep, and here we go. 
just give it a sec. Right. Um, I've got quite a lot to cover in today's presentation, so I will not be reading through all the slides. Um, so if you can read as I talk at the same time, that will be fantastic. Um, so I am an architectural scientist. What I do is that I explain how to make buildings perform and also explain why sometimes they fail. Um, I've been previously a lecturer of architecture uh, at the University of Tasmania and previously also the lecturer and course coordinator in building surveying at Victoria University. Currently, I'm the practice lead for building sciences at Restoration Industry Consultants, RIC for short. Right, uh, I'd like to give you a bit of a background and um, context to this issue of water damage. If we look at this chart report in uh, 2019, they explained the water damage as a very significant problem, particularly water damage arising from internal causes. The same thing to be also seen in other reports, we find that anything related to water damage tends to top the list of insurance claims. Um, Bronwyn Beer recently mentioned that uh, there is a, a significant problem that we are dealing with here because water damage can result in such extensive uh, remediation that sometimes it can cost as much as rebuilding the building. So this is no small matter that we are dealing with. There are um, major implications to water damage. First of all, we're, we're quite familiar that water causes rot. Uh, this publication by QBCC shows in the upper picture um, that the water has caused mold on the surface, but when you scrap the surface, the, the timber is essentially still structural. The one in the bottom, you can drive a screwdriver or a nail through that, in which case the timber can't um, serve as a structural member anymore. So that is one aspect of uh, water damage that the wood, uh, the timber can rot. There is another issue too that um, the mold that forms on the surface could actually create unhealthy conditions. And that has been an area of a tremendous interest for me. We call it mold illness, biotoxin illness, or SIRS, standing for chronic inflammatory response syndrome. The way I would explain it is this, uh, we are exposed to toxins constantly in our, in our environment and our bodies have a way of detoxifying them. As long as we detox quicker than we toxify, then we are like gutters that are clean, right? The downpipes are working, the drainage is working, um, the, the the, the, the gutters don't overflow. However, some people have a genetic predisposition that does not allow them to effectively detoxify. This doesn't mean once they're exposed to a moldy environment, they react straight away. It takes a while for those toxins to build up to a level such that they overflow in way of symptoms, right? This has been a really uh, interesting area of research. In 2018, the Federal Parliamentary Inquiry did a research into biotoxin illness. And last year, I'm very privileged to be part of this National Health Medical Research Council grant uh, led by Macquarie University to look into this issue of chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Uh, this report was done in uh, 2021, and I'd like to thank uh, the VBA for funding this research. I'd like to thank the VMI for actually creating, um, uh, gi giving us the initial data set to work with, where we were able to find very, very interesting patterns. And I did this at Victoria University. I'd like to thank my colleagues, um, Gabe Sorrentino, uh, Richard Berry, and Paulina Rongard for their help uh, preparing this report. Right. Um, I'll start off with the data set. So we had a total of 1,995 accepted claims where we found that water damage existed in one of those defects that were being claimed for. Um, what we did was that the VMI had the data set of uh, all these uh, claims triggered by domestic building insurance. Most of it was as a result of uh, the builder going insolvent. So when that happens, the owner claims uh, for uh, either incomplete work or defective work. So there are, there are rows and rows of defects. We were able to cross-reference that against VBA's practitioner data set so we could match the defects against practitioners in terms of, for example, um, which practitioners were responsible for which buildings and also things like um, when were they registered and so forth. From this, we were able to draw rather interesting patterns. We could see, for example, where were the hot spots of these claims. On the left, we have, a hot, um, we, we have a heat map and we found that a lot of the claims occurred around the CBD and some of the eastern suburbs. The next uh, graphic shows what is the number of claims against the cost of the claims associated with particular practi practitioners. And what we found in that is that there is a small number of practitioners who are responsible for a large amount of claims. The third graphic shows a box and, uh, box and whiskers plot. Uh, we have um, all the claims in the first box. The second box shows what is not water related. And the third box, what is water related? What we find is that water related defects usually cost more on average, and the outliers are a lot, a lot more costly than the average. 
And the final one is basically a frequency plot showing that there are different profiles to each of this with water damage having its own unique profile. But what was really interesting is that from this uh, 1,995 cases, we drilled down into um, just a, a, a sample, 54 cases that we studied in very carefully. What we did was this: with this is that we looked at the insurance report. So this was done by the insurance inspector. We looked at the drawings that were accompanying this report and also if there was available the building permit to see whether there were performance solutions around some of these issues. Um, your screen is not blur. All this are intentionally blurred out because we don't, we, we don't need to identify the information. Some of the key observations we have found so far are that uh, modern buildings and this typologies have designs that tend to compromise water tightness and the ability of the building to deflect water ingress. Secondly, the documentation often was either poor or incomplete. Thirdly, there was a high occurrence of non-compliance in design and construction of these areas, uh, balconies and internal wet areas, so internal and external wet areas. Fourthly, there was improper penetration of waterproofing. Fifth, improper weatherproofing of the envelope. And sixth, um, we found that materials were left exposed for long periods, allowing them to weather and a lot of them to turn moldy. The terminology that I'll be using is going to be a bit more specific. Um, there, there is non-compliance. By this, we mean that they do not conform with the legislature and the um, NCC. So this can happen in the design phase where the designer could have drawn something that was non-compliant. This should be picked up by the relevant building surveyor during the building permit process. If this persists on, sometimes this will result in non-compliant construction, or sometimes the drawings could be correct, but it's constructed wrongly. That should have been picked up during the mandatory inspection stages by either the building inspector or the building surveyor. This is going to be used in different terminology as the word defect. I know quite often we tend to use defect as an overarching kind of a concept, but defect is actually um, a defined term uh, under the Domestic Building Contracts Act, which includes a breach of warranty. An interesting thing is a failure to maintain the quality of work. Now, the breach of warranty we find can consist also of um, not conforming or not building in accordance with the plans and specifications set out in the contract. So here is um, um, a rather interesting scenario that if the building was designed wrong and the builder decided that he would fix it and make it compliant, it actually ends up being read as a defect because it's actually not in accordance with the plan. The builder's obligation under the Domestic Building Contracts Act is to build according to the plan. If the plan, plans are wrong, the proper process is to um, get that referred back to the designer and get it reassessed by the building surveyor before the corrections are being made. What we find in, with the issue of building designs is that um, traditionally there are four ways in which we deal with water ingress. And we call this the four Ds, deflection, drainage, drying, and durability. With modern designs, we find that there's a tendency to remove the first D of being able to deflect the water that comes into buildings. This is an illustration from New Zealand. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I just wanted to show that every one of these labeled points points to a possible water ingress point. Where there's a portable, possible water ingress point, there should be a detail accompanying it to show how it is properly dealt with. With uh, roofs, with eaves, we tend to be able to deflect that water away from the walls. But with parapet roofs and flat roofs, we create a lot more ingress points. The same can be said too of balconies, railings, and so forth. These things create possible pathways for water to enter into buildings. So if we take a brief overview of just a snapshot of these 54 buildings, just glancing at them, you would see a lot of them have what we call a very modern uh, boxy contemporary design with articulated walls that push in and out. This creates well, certain amount of visual interest, and I can I can see the appeal for that. But at the same time, from a technical point of view, it creates a lot more possible ways in which water can enter into building. So, for example, in this case, we find that the structural member is protruding out to hold um, a, a feature, uh, some kind of a, a box feature. When we got structure penetrating through cladding, it's a bit like bone penetrating through skin. Um, yes, it can be done but it has to be done very, very judiciously. And we've got to take a lot of care to make sure that we don't create a water path for water to be driven in along the structure into the building. This is a set of design documentation, and this is our second theme. We find that the documentation can often be poor and complete. This was one of the better set of drawings um, that I came across. And we found that there was 
all in all, just one detail. One, one is to 10 detail. We'll look at this very briefly. I'm not, not, not here to really pick this apart, but some things are, are missing. Firstly, we, we don't have indication of what sarking is to be used, whether it is just to be a sarking or is it going to be a foil blanket. Um, we have um, arrow pointing to a vapor permeable membrane. This has also got to be a water barrier uh, under the NCC 2019. Um, we also don't know where this membrane is to start or to end because the dotted lines are very hard to figure out. Um, we have a flashing here, but the flashing does not have any indication how it is to be formed. We don't know where it starts. We, we kind of can figure out where it ends, but we can't figure out where, where it starts and what the profile is like. We don't have information on how it's to be fastened. We also uh, are creating, in this case, a place where we can have a cold bridge so condensation can happen on the reverse side of that flashing. And how is that going to be dealt with in terms of it not dripping onto the insulation and wetting it? So all these are, are worthwhile considerations. And um, what I would encourage is that we, we need to see documentation that is a far more complete and that would particularly enable the RBS to be able to make an informed decision about whether it is compliant or not. Uh, and, and this has been pulled out also um, when VBA did a desktop analysis of the documentation insights and found that um, in, in the documents they were looking through, um, only 18% had sufficient information around weatherproofing. The same is true too in terms of looking at compliance, 82% it was unable to tell whether it was compliant or it was straightforward non-compliant. So this is an issue that is really worth us paying some attention to. The third theme, balcony waterproofing. Um, there was a high occurrence. Wherever there was balconies uh, as part of um, the design of buildings, quite often we find that there were waterproofing issues with this. So I'm going to look at this in a bit of detail. Here are standard details from AS4654 uh, external uh, waterproofing that shows that there are two ways of dealing with the waterproofing of balconies. One is that you create a step and that step should have a term, an upward vertical termination height that is determined by wind class. The second illustration shows what happens when you don't have the upward step, you need to have a drainage grid at the edge before the sliding doors. So looking at the drawing set, we find that uh, we don't have any indication of whether there was a step in the plans. Looking at the sections, we also can see that there was no difference in heights between the balcony uh, finished floor level and the internal finished floor level, in which case what we would have expected to see was that there should be a drainage grate uh, before the sliding door. It is important to note, to note too that when you design a, um, a drainage grate in a slab, for example, a concrete slab, there is a need to deepen that slab to accommodate that depression. When it comes to, let's say, poles for balustrades or for, for holding up a roof, um, note that the details require that the waterproofing membrane go over the fasteners. So if we can see the fasteners, we have a problem. We have created a passageway where external rain can have a vertical penetration into and past the waterproofing membrane. The same thing also applies to this kind of vertical penetrations. So what we need is firstly a collar that hugs tight against this penetration, that should be waterproofed over. On top of this, there should be a flashing that is clamped down and sealed around with a sealant. And one of the most common penetrations are rainwater down pipes. So when this go through the slabs, and these are not properly detailed, what happens is that we are creating a direct ingress path uh, where water is going to form on the surface of the balcony, and it's going to find that ingress path into and past the waterproofing membranes. Another interesting uh, one was that um, parapets are, just, uh, are meant to um, have an incline back away from the front facade. Now, what happens when this capping meets a wall? I think this is a design issue because what we're creating here is something that is not covered in any of the standard details. So it is important when something like that is designed, it has got to be thought through how it is to be constructed. So in this case, we are actually creating a place for water to stagnate as it is diverted uh, backwards from the capping and against the external wall. And if there's any imperfection in there, the water is going to find a way to penetrate. Box gutters, we saw this quite often, especially when there was a roof plumbing report. Box gutters are meant to be straight without change of direction or change in its sole width. So whenever we see something like that, we notice a non-compliant. Now I can explain why this happens. It, it starts from the design point of view where you want to create an interesting facade by having articulation, have some walls jut out from others. The moment that happens, you end up creating gutters that either have to crank or you have to design the roofs a lot more carefully. Where the roof details aren't supplied quite often, the most 
direct way of solving that would be to design a gutter this way. I just want to point out that this is non-compliant. The NCC gives us some information about how to do flashing. It is not quite as comprehensive as the VBA's Guide to Standards and Tolerance. So I'll use this to explain the concept. Whereas roof flashing, we need two components over that. We have an under flashing that overlaps into the roof. And on top of that, we have an over flashing that it is fixed into um, the wall. In this case, take note that it's about 100 mils fixing that we need to have into the wall. So looking at some of this, illustrations or uh, these photographs, you can see that there is non-compliance in terms of the fastener spacing. The other interesting one here, uh, the small circle, is that there is actually a, a recess inside of this articulated wall. And as a result, the water is flowing down, hitting the flashing, and actually the flashing is now working a bit like a gutter. Now, flashings aren't really designed to be gutters. So all these things, if they are to be designed this way, need to be thought through how they are to be actually constructed. Here are a few cases of um, box gutters. Um, in the first picture, the top left, what we see is that, um, no, this is not a way to deal with uh, the box gutter. It should fall into um, a sump or a, a rain pit. You don't pass it through uh, a parapet. Uh, bottom left, we find that there is no sump, just a downpipe. No, there needs to be a change in direction of the, uh, in terms of change in levels of the box gutter so that it drops and then it goes into the downpipes. Top middle, we find that this sump uh, is actually filled up. And if we look at the bottom right picture, what we see is that the downpipe has been fixed too high so that the water doesn't drain directly into it. It's got to fill all the way up before it starts flowing down. Top right, what we see is that the box gutter is protruding very far into the rain head. When that happens, if the box, uh, uh, if the rain head were to try to overflow, that will be obstructed, resulting in slower drainage of the gutter and a risk of it overflowing. Bottom right picture, we find that the rain head has been installed under the roof over the veranda. So if it overflows, it overflows into the veranda for which the roof was supposed to keep it from getting wet in the first place. Um, th this is a common sight that we see that the uh, rain head overflow is much, much smaller than uh, the downpipe. It should at least be the same because in the event that the downpipe gets blocked, we are relying on the overflow to discharge all the water that falls into the rain head. I'd just like to bring to attention that since uh, uh, July 2021, um, the HP39 has been revised so that um, an overflow that, that is a hole inside the rain head is actually non-compliant. What we need is a weir overflow. The sixth team, and this is something that I think is not just pertinent inside the data set, but very pertinent to us today, is that the construction materials were exposed for a prolonged period, and that allowed um, a suitable substrate for more growth. So if you look at some of these pictures, a lot of this timber products were never intended for external uh, construction. They were not meant to be exposed for a long time. Things like LVL, engineered timber, plywood, and so forth, this were always meant to be exposed only for a minimal amount of time. But what we have seen in this case is that when um, a builder goes insolvent, it could be easily half a year or a year before um, the next builder comes along and resumes the work. During this time, the entire building is exposed and left exposed for a long period, in which case you almost have to reevaluate whether the, the structure is um, the timber is still structurally sound. Um, we also find that because the the uh, we we are we are prior to lockdown stage, the roofs are not on. What we see is that the slabs get exposed for very long periods of time. They accumulate water, and the water particularly sits under the bottom plate and causes that to go very moldy. In the bottom, we see that the roof has been installed, but the gutters have not. And so the bottom right picture, we see that that's the floor under this partially installed roof where everything gets wet and stays wet. Um, one, one rather interesting thing is uh, about particle board flooring. Um, particle board flooring, we found it quite often too, being exposed to weather for a long time. Um, I just like to point out that the tests we have to establish um, the uh, weatherproofing nature of, of particle board flooring, test it on a surface where there is a wax coat. The moment we cut it down to size and we install them and cut notches around it, we create another path for water to pass and, and accumulate inside those particle boards. So we really don't want these particle boards to be exposed for long periods of time. Um, the physical defect that we see is that they will start cupping and they start distorting, but we also concerned that in the process, uh, we are allowing more to grow inside the particle board. 
Weathering is going to be of very uh, much concern to us. Um, in the case of the DBI claims, we find that the vast majority of it, over 90% of the claims are triggered by insolvencies. Um, and we are seeing a lot more of that happening. In fact, in this particular LinkedIn article, uh, Mark Sinfield, he, 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 he's looking at the last trend. It's, uh, we, we do know there have been a lot more insolvencies after COVID as a result of supply chain disruptions, as a result of uh, delays in building products coming to market and also the, the, the tremendous hike, especially around timber and engineered timber products. So things are going to be left outside for a lot longer. I think we need to start uh, facing this reality that uh, we, uh, we, we are dealing with buildings that are exposed with, building with materials that were not meant to be exposed in the first place. Now, we did talk about non-compliant design, non-compliant construction uh, and construction defects. But what if you comply? It is not defective, but at the same time, it is not healthy. Now, this seems to be a bit of uh, an un unfamiliar territory, but I'd just like to point out that there are other laws that have moved ahead of the Building Act and the building regulations. For example, the residential tenancy regulations that was updated with the minimum standards in 2021, they have a condition that as a minimum standard for a property to be rented out, each room in the rental premises must be free from mold and damp caused by or related to the building structure. So whilst we are still figuring out how to get the legislature right um, and, and, and to provide the support we need to get things done correctly, the residential tenancy regulations has moved ahead and said that Look, if these things aren't fixed, you can't rent a place out. And to give you an idea, about 29% of Victorians live in rented properties. So this is a big deal. Now, I'd like to just wrap this up with a few tips. I've got a bit of time, so I'm just going to take my breath and speak about this a little bit more slowly. The, the first thing I like to talk to are uh, to the designers, and I'm speaking this as a former lecturer of architecture, so I do know that you recognize these buildings. These are basically parts of your architectural history slide test, Villa Sova, one of the most famous buildings by Kabuzie. And Madame Sova, the, the, the patron for this building, wrote to Kabuzie said, Dear Monsieur Kabuzie, it is still raining in our garage. You see, he was designing, he was coming up with new concepts of construction and design where he came across with the ribbon windows, flat roofs and so forth. All these were done for the first time. One of the most beautiful buildings in my opinion, and Frank Lloyd Wright says, if the roof doesn't leak, the architect hasn't been creative enough. Now, I am not speaking as somebody from the VBA. I, I, I do not represent the VBA, I speak in my own capacity. I'm not encouraging you to be overly creative. At the same time, I don't want to hold you back. But what I feel is important is that we need to have a competency that is on par with our creativity. And of course, the most famous one, Frank Gehry. And at the start of his talks, he has to give this introduction. My name is Frank Gehry and my buildings don't leak. And you might know the backstory behind this. Now, what has been interesting is that in New Zealand, there has been this case of this award-winning building. There are a few keywords here that jump out to me, tending to favor the wall over the roof. Another one, um, emphasizing spatial continuity with the exterior. When you emphasize the wall over the roof, then you don't deflect the rain. If you have spatial continuity, you also would result in creating a place where outdoor can potentially flood indoors. This citation was given in 2003. In less than 20 years, it has gone from award-winning to demolished, right? It was basically not salvageable. There are design implications to being very creative. And I think that is something for us to take note. So my tips for the designers is that remember, the 40s are your friend, especially deflection. Try not to remove that from the way you design buildings. Design with the capability of detailing, right? Don't get, uh, don't, don't run away with trying to design something that you don't know how to draw the construction details for. But that's not just the only issue. The issue also is that, is the client paying you enough billable hours to do all those details. And I think that is where there is a real struggle and I am sympathetic to it, but this really has to be done. We need to include enough construction details and know that these things are requisite, particularly if standard details aren't available from the NCC, Australian standards or manufacturer's details. I'd like to take a page from the Building Surveyor's Code of Conduct and recommend that for architects and designers. See, building surveyors are required to perform competently and within the required level of expertise 
and experience. And I think this is something that uh, building designers can, can, can learn. This is a really good principle to basically design within your abilities and also design within the amount of uh, time you have allocated for those details. To the building surveyors, uh, my observation has been this, the plans do not have sufficient information to be approved and constructed. And this has also been the observation from the, the VBA's uh, audit of building surveyors drawings. The, the code of conduct does have a special emphasis, especially the first principle talks about always acting and being consistent with an interest for the public. And I think this is where it is sometimes important for us to step beyond just the bare minimum standards. Once again, I speak this in my own capacity. I've written about this, why I believe that there is a need for building surveyors to go beyond the minimum standards of the NCC. Um, I know this is not going to be easy, but I believe that what the building regulations requires is fitness for purpose, especially around health and safety. And that is where it is essential to go beyond the minimum standards and deliver buildings by way of permitting those buildings that meet those criteria and inspecting and approving them for occupancy. I think it's needful to do that with an eye towards making sure that the occupants are kept safe and healthy. To the builders, I'd, li I'd like to give you this word. The, the, the Building Act does place a lot of responsibility on you. In fact, I think you carry primary responsibility that the builder named in the building permit must ensure that the building work is carried out in accordance with the Act <clears throat> and the building permit. One of the things that seems to have not been done very well is the area of external and internal waterproofing. So I just like to highlight this to your attention that both AS4654 and AS7740, that is external and internal waterproofing, say that testing of the membrane needs to be done. Right? Inspection and acceptance testings shall be conducted, shall be, mean it is mandatory. So these things need to be followed up, even though it is not required under uh, the mandatory inspection stages to inspect waterproofing by virtue of the builder being the primary person for meeting the regulations, then AS 4654 and 3740, those inspection stages are actually required as part of this work. Um, and an important note, very often when you're quoting for a job, you probably may not have enough time to work through all the details. I think it is a valid thing after the quote to speak to the architect and designer and say that, look, I don't have enough information. I need to request for more information about how exactly you want these details to be drawn out, uh, how you want this building to be constructed and supply me the details for how this is to be done. These are the problem areas. Uh, keep a lookout for this. Balcony design, internal external waterproofing, parapet cappings, flashings. And finally, tip for plumbers, uh, what we find is that a lot of the water damage does come about from roof plumbing. So exercise diligence in these areas, installing flashing and rainwater goods, things like uh, gutters, rain heads, rain sums, and so forth, and understand what are the compliance requirement in box gutters, sums, and rain heads. Sometimes things have got to go all the way back. I know it's going to be difficult because the roof trusses have already been installed. Uh, it's going to be a pain to fix some of these things, but do understand that that you are the ones that particularly understand and appreciate what the uh, compliance requirements are, and you'll be the best person to tell the builder and, and, and the entire chain what should be corrected. All right, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'd really like to thank you for turning up for this, and I'll be very happy to um, take on any questions. Yep. Um, and now I'd like to pass the time over to Anwar, and he's got some fascinating, uh, a fascinating um, case study that uh, I'm looking forward to his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Tem. So my name is Anwar Gaid, and I work as a principal plumbing specialist in VBA. The VBA is identifying problematic building and plumbing work in buildings. Throughout our proactive inspection program that are inconsistent with the identified in the research. We have a team of expert building and plumbing inspectors that typically look at more than 1,000 sites each month across Victoria for building under construction. Waterproofing and weatherproofing continue to be areas of high compliance risk in domestic and commercial building site inspected. I will present a case study identified through a recent proactive inspection. The case study 
focus on water ingress during construction for a double story townhouse development where there is a visible mold growth on construction material used. And I will discuss the likely causes of the water ingress and mold at the site and the actions builders can take to reduce the likelihood and impact of water ingress. In one fifth of the claims analyzed in the research, construction work was incomplete when the DBI claim was lodged, meaning the extended period before a new builder was appointed was prolonged time. Building element would have exposed and experienced weatherproofing even before the construction complete. Water damage has a significant impact on a construction project in addition to the physical loss Water damage usually impacts the project schedule. In this project, an extended facade and exposed facade with no temporary cover allowed rainwater to enter the building. The greatest amount of visible mold growth observed during the inspection was in the areas with wet floors from water ingress. Wet interior floors combined with the absence of drying factors such as direct sunlight and proper ventilation created a perfectly humid environment that encouraged the mold growth. Does any professional practitioner accept that his or her name is associated with a moldy buildings? The obvious answer is no. I think we can all agree that is not acceptable for building industry to hand over new buildings with hidden black mold. The good news is that many of these factors are avoidable. And as I will explain in my last slide. As you can see, unsecured building openings such as incomplete or deficient roofs, walls, doors, and windows are typical water ingress caused during construction. Until the building envelope is complete, it is the duty of the builder to verify that the exterior openings are sealed and temporary protection is secure. Incomplete roof work as shown in the left photo and incomplete side walls as shown in the right photo allowed water ingress exposing installed or even stored material below to saturation with rainwater. It's logical to complete the building envelope before interior water sensitive work starts below. Before the building envelope is complete and where exterior openings are unavoidable, and storing, and installing temporary closure like tarps, panels, temporary flashing or curbs or water dams around all openings will help keep water from migrating to the building. Incomplete waterproofing on trusses and balconies above covered areas allowed water ingress to divert rainwater away from buildings, roof drains should be connected to temporary or permanent drain piping first. And if the roof and balcony drains are clear with just a strainer in place, that would provide the required water diversion. Water leakage from the non-waterproof balconies above can be traced in the photo and seen at the level below walls and floors. And despite the fact that the water leakage is from the level above, the intensity of black mold at the base of the wall suggests that a wet floor and structure element for an extended period of time are the main causes of black mold growth. Wall closure in this project progressed on site, even with floors underneath and structure elements in the wall cavity will were still wet. That increased the risk of mold growth by preventing air circulation from drying the wet material. Also in this project under the incomplete balcony works, not only the walls, but also the ceilings were closed. As you can see in the photo, the builder began to rectification works by replacing affected areas based on VBA comments. The, pal uh, the plasterboard removed from the ceiling indicates a clearly visible mold. We have also identified an issue with material storage. Builders should always store materials as per the supplier guidelines 
in a safe place where they are unlikely to be damaged. For example, moisture sensitive building materials should be elevated on dunnage of the floor, provided that the floor is clean, clear and dry, and protected with a waterproof cover if exposed to weather. Material storage inside the building may also cause, uh, may be cause a trip hazard. As you can see in the photos, there is a clear material issue and a problem in this site. Temper windows frames left on wet floor resulted in visible mold growth after window installation. We also noticed that gaps around roof penetrations are not probably sealed, which would allow water ingress to the building. It is critical to the structure integrity of buildings and the health of bu building occupants that all participants in the construction of a building take active steps to limit building materials exposure to moisture during construction. Methods to mitigate and reduce water exposure risks should be developed both before and during construction. Funding for them should be included in the project budget. In this slide, I will summarize the lessons learned from the case study and condense them into four recommended steps to manage water ingress and its damaging effects during construction. As probably most of you would agree that prevention is the best protection. And prevention requires a plan. Planning means that the builder prioritizes construction phases to provide the maximum weather protection for vulnerable materials. An example of this would be completing the building envelope, such as roofs, walls, trusses, balconies, before installing the interior material. Also, prioritize permanent or temporary drains and overflow as well. A second important step is to provide temporary protection against water ingress by covering gaps in the building envelope with external cover like tarps until the envelope is complete. The third measure I recommend is to probably, to probably store construction material on site by storing material in a dry space, raising material above floor or ground, and providing proper cover if stored in an open area. Finally, sometimes it's simply a matter of allowing materials to dry by sun exposure, natural ventilation, or dehumidifier, then assessing the impact of moisture on the affected materials. However, if there is a mold growth visible, concealing the issue is not a solution. It's critical to seek expert advice, for example, from a structure engineer or a mold remedification specialist. Some materials may need to be completely replaced. It's critical to address mold issues as soon as possible because concealing mold increases the potential for widespread mold growth in the building during normal operation. So, every effort should be made to avoid during construction. The VBA strategic plan includes a great focus on mold issues in the future. This includes our research programs and target inspection program. And now we have around um, 10 minutes to respond to questions submitted during the presentation. Of course, we will not be able to probably address all of the question today but we will uh, endeavor to do so in coming weeks. Just pick some uh, of the question from the chat. Uh, thanks, um, thanks Anwar and thanks uh, Tim Law for your presentations um, and to our participants for, um, for the questions. Um, uh, as uh, mentioned by Anwar, uh, happy to take some questions. Um, uh, we do have some here, so um, I've got one here. How long are untreated timber frames flooring allowed to be exposed before potential issues occur? Um, I'll correct that one at uh, Tim. How long are they allowed to before they require to be replaced? Is that the question? Uh, how um, long are how long are untreated timber frames flooring allowed to be exposed before potential issues occur? I think it all depends on the weather too. Um, 
Now, I don't think we've got very specific guidance around this. And so I'm just, um, yeah, I, I think that that is my bottom line. We don't have specific guidance around this. And as a result for that, what you want to do is that you want to basically ensure that rot has not set in. Um, so with the idea of using a screwdriver or a knife to um, pierce the timber to make sure that uh, it is still solid. And if, if you're in doubt, by all means, reach out to somebody who, who knows this matters and get a structural engineer, get somebody who is familiar with mold to be involved. Just from the structural side, uh, from the health side, once you can see visible mold, you, you do have an issue. So yeah, that, that is something that has got to be remediated. Thanks, Tim. Um, we've got another one. What are the best methods to rectify or remediate mold affected construction materials during construction? Uh, and or is that one you were able to address? Sorry, again, the question, sorry. Uh, what are the best methods to rectify or remediate uh, mold affected uh, construction materials during construction? Uh, well, if it is really there is a visible mold, the proper solution will be to consult, consult with a modification uh, specialist. And if the affected is goes to the structure as well, it's, um, it's recommended to consult with a structure engineer. Thanks, Emma. Could I pipe in on that? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so there, there are a few ways in which it can be remediated. For example, one, one method is dry ice blasting. Another one is to um, clean the surface. Um, for sure, uh, cleaning and HEPA vacuuming is gonna be part of the solution. Which one is the right solution in which context? I think it is quite specialized and that's where it's good to get some advice on that matter too. Terrific, thanks Tim. Um... Another one, does the presence of mold on construction materials make that material defective or non-compliant? Um, I can probably address, this, address that one. Um, uh, so I think it would definitely make it defective from a, um, so it's not fit for purpose, uh, not um, part of the material um, specification. So it's uh, definitely something that's not, not wanted by a building owner. Um, non-compliant is, um, Probably a little bit more difficult, but um, my uh, position would be that it does. It is something that affects the health, safety, and amenity of the occupants in the building, and so I think it should be addressed as part of the um, considerations in the, in the building process, uh, and should be uh, considered for removal if it's identified on site. Is there any other anything else? Anyone want to add on that one? Uh, got another one, uh, what is the minimum level of design detail that designers should include in their design documentation? Uh, Tim, I'm throwing that one to you. Yeah, sure. Um, in, in the report, I mentioned um, a reference to what has happened in Tasmania. So um, in Tasmania, um, the Director of Building Control uh, issued a schedule called Schedule 1, which, um, which has the minimum number of drawings that are to be supplied. Um, so plans, details, and so forth. The idea is that um, the building surveyor should not review the drawings until the designer can tick that all the required drawings under Schedule 1 have been submitted. So that, that, that would be a good reference to what is required in, in Tasmania. Um, so if you're looking for guidance around that, I'd say that's a good place to start. Um, at this point of time, I don't think we have um, mandated any min minimum in Victoria. Thanks, Tim. Um, and another one, uh, what should a building surveyor or building inspector do if they observe mould on construction materials during an inspection? Um, and I suggest that they should uh, be looking at having that uh, addressed. So it would be um, a, an assessment by an appropriate uh, specialist as to uh, what uh, rectification should actually occur, uh, especially at the construction stage, uh, if there's materials already exhibiting mould uh, and moisture conditions exist in the building at a later date, there's a high chance that um, mold will continue in the building and cause um, potential issues for occupants at a later date. Um, were there any other questions that uh, either Tim or Anwar picked up in the conversation and the Q&A? Um, we've got a heap of questions here, so I think we might have to uh, give them time uh, try and address some of those post the presentation. Um, yeah. 
So, um, given uh, given the time, uh, well, we might sort of um, uh, look to uh, thank both uh, Dr. Tim Moore and Anwar for their presentations, uh, and um, to all of you as our um, attendees. Thank you for attending. Um, as you've heard today, mould during construction is a critical issue, and concealing mould isn't uh, a solution to the problem. Uh, concealing mould increases the potential for future mould in the building, and every attempt should be made to prevent mould in the construction phase. Uh, good building practices such as storage of building materials and protection of building works are critical to reduce the likelihood of um, mould. And it is disappointing to see examples of poor practices such as plasterboard linings being installed in buildings before the building is fully enclosed. Design and detailing require a greater focus from designers to minimise the risk of um, moisture ingress uh, in uh, buildings. It's also important to note uh, from some of the questions that I've uh, looked at that the BBA is uh, a regulator and does not write the policy uh, that regulates registration of practitioners or requirements for mandatory inspections. Um, regulation reform is the role of uh, DELF, which is now um, DTP, Department of Transport and Planning. Uh, and uh, work like this uh, research assists in supporting the case for regulatory reform um, and I think uh, things like uh, registration of um, waterproofers is being considered under trade reach um, legislation. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, hope you've enjoyed the session. As mentioned, we'll hope to uh, look at uh, addressing some of the other questions um, and uh, we'll be sending an email within the next week that includes a webinar survey. Uh, so please complete that and return it. Uh, and. Um, We'll also be sending uh, proof of attendance and a link to today's webinar that uh, was recorded uh, and the slideshow. Uh, also encourage you to get onto our website and uh, check out uh, our other practitioner education series webinars um, that we'll be holding through the year. Uh, and uh, check out our website for other information that uh, is um, of value to the building industry. Thank you and uh, have a good afternoon.